Hey guys, my name's Gary, Gary Brown, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and drug addict. So, I want to talk a little bit about what it's like, uh, what it's been like in my sobriety, losing my son to an accidental fentanyl overdose four months ago. Um, and I, when I got the news, um, when I got the news, I had, um, four months sober. Um, I actually just took seven months, so it was three, like three and a half months ago, I found out. Uh, yeah, three and a half months, say. Um, and I've got, uh, seven, a little over seven months of sobriety. And I got that news that night. My son came in and, um, my own my oldest son knocked on my door and said, Hey, Dad, um, you know, it's Brandon. He's, and I knew. I mean, he just, he didn't have to say anything uh, else. I just, um, I was laying in bed and I was praying. Um, I was worried about him because he wasn't answering his phone. Um, my son's name was Brandon Brown. He came, he flew in from uh, New Jersey to Long Beach to make a a video with uh, some friends and a television personality. And, uh, you know, it was just like a fun spirited video. And um, he flew in a couple weeks prior and he was working around the clock doing editing and and, uh, you know, my son was a lot like me. I have three sons. And this son was a lot like me when it came to drugs and alcohol. He had that obsession, that compulsion, that obsession to drink and use. And it was been a monkey on his back. Um, he was a creative kid and funny as hell. Um, he just, he had a personality and... The only way I could, he had, he had, he was real stubborn. He was like me. I could be super stubborn and every once in a while I could crack him ever since he was a little kid, you know, he'd be like pouting and trying to get his way. And even up till the last trip I, I had with him a year ago, I spent Christmas with him in New Jersey and New York. Um, and I cracked him with something really funny. I, I, I forget what it was, but you know, I, I had to be witty and funny and he was just kind of being in a bad mood and I said something that that got him you know and it's it was goofy and funny and and he couldn't stop but just start laughing you know and uh he was he's missed man he's really missed and I know his brother's miss him and his mom misses him and um his cousins and his grandparents and aunts and uncles he was just a joy and a character um fentanyl took him out and we don't know if he was shooting straight fentanyl or or if he thought he was shooting heroin and and it was laced with fentanyl we just don't know until toxicology reports come out they're probably due in in the next probably any day now um and then we'll we'll have that information but I'm going to try to keep it together for this video and, um, you know, I want to make people aware of this fentanyl pandemic and, uh, kind of let, let you guys know it's possible to stay sober through something like this and also to let you know that there's a fentanyl pandemic going on out there and it's the number one leading cause of death in the United States. <laughs> So the way I was living my life was, uh, before I got sober, was uh, living day to day and um, like a fucking cowboy. And I loved my family, but I didn't show up for them much. And, um, you know, I ended up getting sober. And when I get sober, then, you know, I want to participate in everybody's life again. Um, and it 
you know, people don't come around that quick, you know, when, when you've been missing and missing in action. And, uh, I was doing my own thing and kind of propelled myself and living on self-will and I wasn't causing a lot of damage to relationships or anything like that, but it was just, it was kind of like a slow downhill, uh, just not showing up for events. And when I did show up, I was physically and not, I wasn't mentally or emotionally, spiritually present. Um, it was, I was kind of a sad case. Didn't have a lot of friends. The people I hung out with were, you know, they used drugs and alcohol. And I, if, if I was hanging out with them, I wanted something from them. Um, it was a very rare occasion that I was hanging out with somebody, you know, to do something good for them or anything like that. It was always, what am I going to get out of this deal? So, but the impact that this had on me, what happened was we were all worried about my son because he was put together like me and he lived his life on the edge um, and he had a, a, I don't want to get too much into his story, but he had an alcohol problem his whole life and a drug problem his whole life, just like I have. And I've spent many years sober and many years fucked up. Um, so he wasn't answering his phone. I was worried as hell about him. I left him a message that night because his phone was going right to voicemail. And I said, Brandon, I'm really worried. You need to call me, buddy. I just had a feeling in my inside me. Now, I've had that feeling before because it's fear. It's fear of the worst. Uh, I had been to his house before, kicking in windows and doing all kinds of shit when he's nodded off or whatever. And we rarely got along because we were put together so much alike. We loved each other. We were close, but we rarely got along. If that makes any sense, I'm sure it does to a lot of parents and a lot of kids. Um, so I went to bed that night. We talked about him at dinner with, uh, with my son a little bit and I talked about him with my boss. I drove around town with my boss that day. We were looking for apartments, the owner of my company and I said, yeah, I'm really worried about my son. And, uh, it, you know, it was just, uh, we, I just briefly went over it. And he went through uh, some stuff that he, you know, his experience that he had with some relatives. And um, we made a connection there a little bit. Then I went home. I went to dinner with my son and his girlfriend. And we, we talked about him a little bit. It was funny. We talked about God. And it was funny that night at dinner. You know, they're both on the fence, my son and his girlfriend, maybe a little bit about the whole God thing and all that stuff. And I said, you know, what brought me really close to God and what made me a really strong believer is in the bad times, the horrendous times in my life, like when I lost a loved one. I lost a, a woman I was in love with in 2005. And there were some events that happened around that death that made me a very strong believer. And <clears throat> I was the closest to God I had ever been through that. And what I had told them at dinner was something similar to this, that when something tragic happens in your life, you know, that's when you really need God. You can't be blaming him, you know, things just happen. And you can't be bl blaming your higher power for things that are happening in the, in the world today. That's when you need your, to gravitate towards your higher power. And that's what gets you through things, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to break down a little bit how this worked for me. So I'm, I go into this a very strong believer. Um, about 20 minutes before. I'm not sure of the time because I was kind of dozing off when my son knocked on my door. I was in prayer for the longest I had ever been in prayer. And I was in my bed, snuggled up with my dog. And I was saying, God, please watch over my son. God, I know you exist. And I know you've got this thing in your hands. I'm having a hard time trusting you. I'm really worried about my son. 
please watch over him. God, please. And I just kept saying this, God, please watch over my son. And I hear, and then I, I stopped praying. My cat's bothering me here. Um, so um, I'm dozing off, and the, I hear the knock on the door. And I jump up, and I, you know, I look out the window. I see it's my son's legs. You know, he was wearing shorts. And I, I, I saw his legs, and I was like, what the fuck's he doing here? And I ran to the front door. I opened the door, and I saw the look on his face. And I knew, and he goes, Dad, it's Brandon. And I fucking, uh, I walked into the bedroom, and I just hit the floor. And uh, start, I knelt on the bed and just, I was kneeling and, and hunched over the bed. Then my son sat next to me and he grabbed my hand. And we just cried, man. I, I just wailed. I don't even know for how long. And then I went over to the door and hung on the doorknob and just wept hard. And... While I'm weeping and getting it out and thinking, my poor baby boy, I'm my baby boy, the worst thing just happened to my baby boy, what I've been warning him about his whole life happened. Oh my God, my baby boy, please, no. And my son is saying, Dad, you gotta breathe. You gotta fucking breathe, man. And at that moment, after about 20 minutes of that, something, a strength came through me. And I heard a voice say, you have a son in the room and he just lost his brother. And I stood up, I stopped crying. I took my shirt off. You know, I, I had snot and tears. I blew all that shit out of my nose. I put on a clean shirt, threw my shirt on the ground, and said, let's go, let's go to your mother's. And my youngest son was with his mother, my ex-wife, um, my son who passed away, his mother. And uh, I think my son said, Dad, we're, we're gonna have to go to mom's. And I said, let's go. So we walked downstairs and then I hugged him and we both cried for a second and held each other. And uh, I just had a strength about me. And I was open to, you know, I'm in shock at that point. And um, I just, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, and uh, I had a strength about me. I called my brother. I said, Charlie, um, Brandon's gone. He says, what do you mean? I said, the worst thing has happened. He just, he sh he had an accidental fentanyl overdose. He's, he's gone. And he's like, no, God, no. You know, then he tells my, his, his son, my, my son's cousin, who they are close. They were talking on the phone every night and everything. Your cousin's gone and the ripple, the waves, you know, continue to go out throughout the family. And my mother calls me and she's hysterical because my brother called my mother, I called my sister. Um, I don't know, I had the strength to do all that stuff. And, you know, something took over and it was my God taking care of me. He had my son. And, uh, my son is with him now. So I get to my ex-wife's house and we're all there as a family. Myself, my two sons, my ex-wife who was in bed and a, and a complete basket case like I was. And um, my sons, um, Sorry, my son's girlfriend, Taylor, was there. And we 
we got through it as a family. We just wept and uh, were in shock and uh, I watched God work. He had his hand on everybody. And um, my, my two sons have just handled this uh, so stoically and just they're two pillars of strength and I know they've had their moments but uh, I look at them and just think these are amazing kids right so I remember I called my boss, it was about midnight or so, and I said, hey chief, um, I got bad news and uh, my son, he's gone, he passed away from an accidental fentanyl overdose, I'm going to be off taking care of some business, and he said, yeah, oh my God, man, I'm so sorry, you know, take care of what you need to take care of, I got you, you know, here at work. So, the Long Beach corner needed a signature and an ID on my son's body. So, I, what I did is I knew I had to go to Long Beach in the morning. And uh, I came back home really sorry guys it's taken this long to get through this but um so I come back to my apartment and I it was really tough to be alone so I uh my son calls because I'm thinking how the fuck am I supposed to be alone right now and the phone rang and my it was my oldest son him and his fiance, they have a baby. Uh, he was just born maybe a few weeks prior to this happening. And uh, they said, hey, he said, hey, if you don't want to be alone, come on over. They live like they lived like a quarter of a mile down the street. So I, uh, I, I ran to my truck and jumped in my truck and got in the truck and, um, drove to their house and I walk in the front door and I walk and he goes like this he hands me the baby and you know when I was drinking and using I was only capable of feeling like one feeling either happy or anger sad depressed Joy and and sadness couldn't coexist in this spirit together, okay? And he hands me the baby. And as fucked up as I was from this whole thing, I'm holding this innocent, loving, beautiful baby that bears my name. Uh, my last name and he's the latest member of our family the Brown family and I the, the two feelings of I don't know how to explain this but the way I'm going to the two feelings of deep grief excruciating pain and gratitude coexisted within my spirit okay and I'm holding the baby and I held him for quite a while that night and weeping and crying and looking at how beautiful he was he still is and looking at how beautiful he was and thinking about how my middle boy Brandon 
didn't get to experience that joy holding his nephew. And that, that hurt, you know. That made me really sad. Um, so I, I laid on the couch and um, I got, I don't think I slept. Maybe I nodded in and out for a couple hours and I got up probably 5 a.m., gave him a hug, said I got some shit to do. And I knew I had to get on a plane and I, I had no fucking idea how I was to travel. Number one, I was broke. <laughs> Number two, I was a basket case of emotion. And I, I had no idea how, how I was going to do it. I asked God for help. I was sitting in this chair right here. And while I was sitting there praying, a thought came to mind. Turn on your video. Let people know what just happened. And let people know that you're sober and you're going to remain sober through this because you have a God in your life. Okay? I don't know. I don't think like that. You know? I, I, I had made a couple of videos. I hadn't posted any, but I had this thing in my head that I was going to post some a couple of videos and help people get sober, right? Tell them what I did to get sober. Well, all of a sudden this comes to mind. So I I make the video, it took, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. It was less than that, it's like 10 minute video, I think. I've never been able to watch the whole thing. It's very tough for me to watch. And uh, it's the first video on my channel. So subscribe to my channel and watch the video. And, uh, then, like I said, there was a strength about me, a strength knowing that I have a son and he got himself in a pickle and he, he overdosed and killed himself accidentally. And now he's got the whole family in a pickle. And uh, I've got to try to be the leader through this thing and um, keep my shit together. Um, and I've got a history of being a fucking whack job, you know, drinking and using uh, with behavior on extreme levels, you know, fighting and just being a dickhead or whatever, right? Um, so I've been God conscious through this whole thing and I've handled it I'm not patting myself on the back I'm patting my God on the back through this one um, and the program that I'm in is called Alcoholics Anonymous um, I pat I give all the credit to that God of my own understanding how limited it is and the credit to God so I'm, I'm sitting in that chair. I make that video. I call my sister. I said, I got to get to L.A. I don't have any fucking money. She goes, don't worry about it. Um, let me see what flights are available. She booked my flight. I had to do nothing. My sister was, you know, my sister carried me through this thing. Like, she was right there, man. She did so many things for me that I don't even know, you know, I could never repay. <laughs> so, um, I'm asking myself, I'm, she books me the flight. She's like, you leave at noon or whatever. I, it was somewhere around noon. And it was like five in the morning, six in the morning, seven in the morning. <laughs> And I'm thinking, how the fuck am I going to get on a fucking plane? I've got every piece of fucking clothing just filthy. You know, um, I needed to do laundry that day. And I couldn't put it together to do laundry. 
So I threw a bunch of fucking dirty clothes in a bag, got in my truck, and I'm thinking, I start the truck, how in the fuck am I gonna do this, man? I'm like weeping, like like no control over the, 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 the intense pain, right? And the phone, the phone rings, and I hear an old friend's voice from Alcoholics Anonymous that I haven't heard for 10 years. And he says, hey, Gary, it's Randy. And he didn't even have to say who it was. I just um, broke into tears, man. This is a strong motherfucker, right? This is the guy that if shit's going down, you want him in your corner, you know what I mean? And he walks that walk in AA. He's also a guy that I think I loaned like $4,000 to and he paid me back the day he said he was gonna pay me back, which fucking never happens. And he's just a, a solid fucking human being. And that strong man who called me gave me the strength to get on the get on that fucking plane because he said, "Hey, uh, I'm living in Arizona now. <clears throat> I was flying into L.A. or Long Beach, identifying his body, and then going back to Palm Springs where my parents live." He goes, "Hey, I'm going. I'm living in in Arizona. I'm going to be driving right through Palm Springs to hit Laguna over the weekend. I'll fucking pick you up, man, or we'll go hit a meeting." And I was like, "Fuck." I ain't missing this shit for anything, right? <clears throat> I picked up my, my youngest son. He took me to the airport. He took my truck for the week. So I got on that plane, went and identified my son's body. My, my sister and my mother picked me up. We go in, we drive from Long Beach Airport to the other side of Long Beach, the north side. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the west side of Long Beach, which is almost San Pedro, and might even be in Pedro, where the coroner's office is, and, um, and I identify my son's body, I walk out the front door, and lost my shit all over again. Uh, I don't think I've ever cried that hard in my life. My mom and my sister stayed inside and took all the details, you know, of everything because I couldn't process I couldn't retain information <laughs> they took care of all the details and um, I signed the paper and, and, and walked out and we we got in the car and that that strength came about me again like put your shit together you got to put it together and be strong right now and you're doing this for your son this is not about you and those kind of thoughts, I'm sorry, don't run through my head naturally. Um, it was about my son. It was about uh, him. Putting, you know, cleaning up some mess that he left. And being there for him in his name. So that's what I did. And I did it with grace and dignity and created no wreckage in the process. So, and miracles happen all the way around this thing. Family relationships rekindled between my mother and my sister, my father and my sister. I mean, shit that these people weren't gonna fucking talk until the, they were gonna die off this planet. Those, and those relationships have been rekindled because of my son passed away. And we got, we all dealt with it as a family. The relationship between me and my ex-wife. There's a mutual understanding. We both lost a son. As much as I want to disagree with one thing that she does or she wants to disagree with how I've lived my life or whatever, we, we find that mutual ground. We both buried a son. And I think uh, there's a mutual respect there. I know there is on my end. And, and I've seen it on hers. So... Um, I mean, we're not sitting here going to dinner every night or anything like that. I mean, that's possible. I mean, we do that, th those things. 
but I'm, I'm just, I'm not saying that things are all perfect and better. I'm just saying we have a mutual respect for one, one, one another and we, we treat each other with kindness and love. Okay. And that hasn't always been the case. So God, again, God, when God, when you bring God into things, okay, the hardest things in your life, and you, and you don't blame him, like, look what you did to me, when you realize it's not God doing that, it's just, that's the way the world is, we don't have to ask why, we could just ask God for his strength, his love, his kindness, his gentleness, and try to spread that wherever we go, his strength, try to bring that into our life, wherever we go, that's been my experience, so, uh, we waited almost 60 days and we had a service for my son and I had a eulogy, I did a eulogy for him and you know, I don't know how great the eulogy was, but it was hard to do, but I kept it together and, and there was, I brought some humor into it and I brought some, you know, something that I think my son would have loved, you know, my son died at 27, my son was an artist and he was like this visionary and he was out there a little bit like he didn't think like the way a lot of people think you know this is a, a guy where when, when he was five years old I remember him sitting in bed with his hands like this and his legs were crossed and he's laying on his back and he's on the lower bunk and I sat down next to him tuck him in and I would always fuck I make him crack up so easily right and like he was just a fucking <laughs> he was a fuck off man his whole life he was just making people laugh and um he I could always make him laugh man especially when he was a kid <laughs> and he goes hey dad you know I go what are you thinking about buddy and he goes I was thinking about like do you ever think about dark holes in in uh like in the atmosphere, you know, in space, like dark holes and like if there's life and, or extraterrestrial activity on other, in, in other universes or planets or anything. <clears throat> this kid's five years old. And I'm like, no, I really don't think about that stuff too much, son. Um, you know, my, my head's pretty much wrapped around a business right now. So I don't really get time to go there. But <laughs> what do you like? Tell me about it. What are you thinking about? Any? He was like so curious about all this shit that's, that we don't know about, right? Um, stuff I think about now, you know, the realm of the spirit and, you know, what is God, you know, you know, how does it work? And, you know, the shit we don't have the answers for, but we, we take that leap of faith like I did the day I found out. <laughs> God has entered my spirit, man. I'm a changed man from what I drank and used. Um, I'm a kind, loving man. There's a, and it shows a lot. And I'm also a tough man. And I've got a bad side to me, too, that, that could be, you know, prideful and egotistical. And that stuff's ugly, you know, when that, when that stuff rears its ugly head. So it's hard to know when to dig your heels in in life. I used to choose every fucking battle to dig my heels into. And um, knowing which battles to choose uh, is a big thing, you know. My son and I like to choose every battle. And, uh, you know, save your energy for the big battles. Let the little ones that... Let them roll right off your fucking back and move forward. You know, live, live a happy and purposeful life. It's a lot easier to do when your heels aren't dug in on stupid fucking battles that, that are meaningless and mean nothing, that are just pissing contests of pride. So, big lesson. It took me a lot of battles to learn that. And, uh, I was able to show up. I had that, that strength about me 
the day of the service, I was able to be present for every conversation that I had with, you know, there had to be a hundred people there and I didn't get to stand and talk with every single person, but I got to stand and talk to probably 40 of them, you know, and the other ones I just hugged or shook their hand or said hi or whatever. And, you know, I probably had 40 conversations and I was present trying to be as focused and as present on the conversation and not thinking about anything else. And I showed up for my son only, you know, only for him did I show up. There was no other reason that I showed up. And I wanted to, you know, there was part of me that wanted to get involved in seating arrangements and, you know, all this stuff and stuff where my pride got involved. And you know what, I, I, I talked about it with my ex-wife um, a little bit. I told her how I felt very, very, um, we, we had a good conversation, a very hard conversation, but we both behaved well and, um, we both hurt each other and, uh, all that stuff. I, you know, I gave it to God after we talked on the phone, I gave it to God and everything was absolutely perfect. And it can only be perfect if you surrender the outcome, right? So I, I had no anticipation of any outcome. I was just there to be of maximum service to my son who passed away, to my family members, and to help anybody that was having a hard time. I was like trying to go through his friends and everything. You know, it had been 60 days, so people had processed the loss. So it wasn't like everybody was still in shock, which was actually worked out really good. Um, I mean, for the family and everybody else, it was, uh, it made it a much more peaceful, loving, positive event. You know, there were still tears shed, but there was a lot of laughter and also, you know, remembering the real character my son was. So it turned out beautifully. I had no idea it would go this long, but I just, the importance of bringing God into your life with any event, your sobriety, a death of a loved one, everyday business, getting up in the morning. I can't tell you when I bring God into my day, it's my juice for the day. It's my strength. It's my peace of mind. It's my strength. It's knowing when to dig those heels in. It's knowing when to let it fall off your back. You know, let it, let it, let let something roll off your back instead of getting involved with some idiot over a fucking battle at work or, you know, whatever. I just, you know, life is just much more comfortable and, and much better. My relationships are much, go much smoother. I tend to my relationships better. And it's all just by bringing God into my life on a daily basis, doing some self-reflection, sharing about my defects of character with other people that that are doing what I'm doing and going to a few meetings a week. And I live a fucking great life. My life is getting better daily, daily. And I, I, I really watch to stay out of self-pity. I go into self-reflection -re only to better myself, not to go into self-reflection and beat the shit out of myself or go into self-pity. You know, I use God in those situations where I'm feeling vulnerable to self-pity, feeling vulnerable to to anger, feeling vulnerable to uh, any any negative emotion, I bring God into that situation and I express myself either in a meeting or with another person that's doing the same thing that I'm doing, whether they have 30 days or 30 years. And I'm living a very good, clean life right now. And walking through this stuff with a a strength about me, able to perform my, my work uh, at, at the top, at the most highest level right now. And I love this thing that I'm doing. I love this thing that we do. And uh, that's my story about my sobriety through the last seven months and through losing my son and bringing God into my life. So thank you for listening. I hope you guys bring that, you know, you know, higher power into your life. 
whatever you want to call it, and start praying to it. It doesn't have to be the word God. It could be higher power. It could be the universe. It could be whatever you want it to be. Good energy. Pray to it. Bring it back. Bring that stuff into your life. You watch what happens. Subscribe. Let's do this thing together, you guys. Please subscribe. Hit the like button. And I'll talk to you guys in a day or two.